At the end of last year, I was in Melbourne and lucky enough to attend the Ant Health Digital Health Summit, which focused on the future of Australia's fast growing digital health sector. It was a great way to reflect on the year that 2022 was and think about the opportunities ahead. During the event, I got to speak to four speakers who appeared on the stage at different points throughout the day, who will be featuring in this podcast episode for you today. First up today on the show, I speak to healthcare investor, entrepreneur and strategist from the US, Lisa Suenen, talking about how digital health has evolved over the years and how health tech companies can get buy-in from venture capital firms. Then I speak to Elizabeth Koff, Managing Director at Telstra Health, about what the dynamic is of digital health post-COVID and how we sustain this change following the pandemic. Then I speak to Luke Renahan, CEO and founder of VaxApp, about health tech startups and the importance of buying Australian-made for healthcare procurement teams. Then I speak to Dr. Brandon Karp about how it's not just okay for clinicians to be an entrepreneur, but why we need more clinical entrepreneurs in the Australian healthcare system. So here it is. Collaboration starts with the conversation, Team Health Tech. Let's make it happen. This is Talking Health Tech with me, Peter Birch, featuring content and community about technology in healthcare. Hi, I'm Lisa Soonan. I'm a longtime healthcare investor, entrepreneur, and strategist. And I'm currently uh, both president of uh, digital and data solutions at Canary Medical, but I'm also still advisor and, and leader at several venture funds. Amazing. Visiting Australia? I'm visiting Australia from San Francisco. Amazing, amazing. So you're. And I'm, I, I'm, I should say I'm international uh, advisory board chair of the Ant Health Plus program. Yeah, it's, sometimes, it, you know, people who attend these sessions, they've got a. When you say, what do you do? It might go for... for how much time do you have? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so in this context, that's that's really helpful. But um, I just accosted you from the stage and brought you over to have a chat here. Talk to us a bit about um, what you were taking through the group today in this particular session and maybe what you're also talking about later today as well. Sure. So I was really talking about how digital health has evolved since its early days in the early 2000s, mid 2000s to now mm-hmm. And how it is, you know, kind of following the classical Gartner hype cycle curve. Ah, yes. Uh, where it's, you know, peaked and now is coming down the uh, the other side of the curve. Um, Wait, where, where, what stage are we at now? Then? They're cl- heading towards the trough of disillusionment, okay. if you ask okay. me. Good start to the day then. But I think, <laughs> you know, it's also a, a time for us to evaluate how we go about, you know, building these companies. Mm. Because there are still some great opportunities. And I think there's still a tremendous amount of opportunity ahead of us. But we have to get through, you know, the down cycle and get rid of the excess and yeah. um, and think about products and services that have more impact than maybe some of the companies have had. Got it. So we're at this kind of almost a, a shakeout stage where those important parts kind of start to lift through a little bit more. And so, so where are some of those key priorities and focus areas that you think that organizations should be focusing on? Hmm. I think they need to be focusing more on a better use of the data to make a difference, yes. not just availability of lots of data, yeah. but how do you use it to make a real difference, um, both on the clinical side and the economic side. I think we're, we're at a time when we need to be focusing on how we make care access and, and the delivery of care to patients less disaggregated. I mean, we've really kind of pulled it apart you know, mm. between virtual care and very specialized care and you know all sorts of, you go here for this digital therapeutic and that session and that care for this. And it's too complex for patients. And yeah. I think we need to have ways to bring that back together to make it simpler. Yes. Um, and I think there's also a lot to be done in making digital health meaningful for pharma and med tech in a meaningful, you know, in a meaningful and a uh, true business ad, not a, just a sort of sideshow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities there as well. I caught something that you said during, uh, I think during the Q and A and it was uh, about time mm. and expectations around time. How do mm-hmm. you think about that for, for digital health organizations? Well, it's funny. You know, people think about venture-backed companies generally in healthcare mm. and healthcare specifically is taking years to materialize and mature for they're ready really to exit. It's very different than tech. Yeah. When digital health started, you know, bubbling up in a big way in the last five years or so, mm. uh, I think people made a mistaken assumption that it would be more like tech than like healthcare. Yes. That it would take five years, you know, and the company would be fine, and we all, you know, roll around in the money. Ten years, yeah, yeah. Well, the truth of the matter is, it takes eight to ten years in healthcare, and sometimes mm. more. You know, there's healthcare companies that I invested in that are, you know, fifteen years on and still not exited. Mm. They're good companies, but they're not ready. Yeah. 
And I think we need to think about these companies as healthcare companies that use technology as opposed to tech companies that happen to be in healthcare. Mm. Got it. That's a, a good way to think about it, particularly for the expectations on both sides, for those organizations speaking to VCs in the mm-hmm. first place and getting that buy-in, but then also from the, the VC side, understanding health and, um, and working through with those founders. Uh, and then you coming from uh, the US, looking into mm. Australia and doing a bit of a, a, a junket tour. And as you mentioned, yeah. too, I'm involved I- internationally, um, generally with investment. How do you find looking at the two markets, you know, what... Um, perhaps Australia could be uh, learning from the US or, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. What should Australia be doubling down on that we do really well here that potentially other markets don't? Well, it's a very impressive entrepreneurial environment here. You know, there's mm. a lot of energy, there's a lot of entrepreneurship, there's a lot of interest in health, and that's great. You know, I think there's an expectation here that you must come to the US to make it a good company. And I don't think that's correct. Mm. I think it's hard to come to the US, uh, very hard, and that the market here is quite different, and the products are designed for this market. Mm. They're not designed generally for the US market, and so you have to make pretty fundamental changes a lot of the time. Yeah. So I encourage, often encourage companies, not always, but I often encourage companies to think about other markets first than the US. I mean, mm. there's a lot more similarity in some of the markets in Europe, for instance, or Singapore, or whatever. Yeah. Um, that having been said, you know, there certainly are opportunities but you have to remember that there's an awful lot of businesses already in the U.S. And m- most of them, are, you know, most of the things I've seen from Australia, not all, but most, there's a corollary company or five or ten in the mm. U.S. And so to make the leap, you have to really make a good case for why yours is better than the local homegrown stuff. Because yeah. there's sort of, a you know, the usual default to preferring something local, right? Yeah. And um, that can be difficult. Yes. I hear organizations or, or um, you know, looking at a strategy when taking a global perspective, looking at Australia as a great market to demonstrate mm-hmm. the capability, but then use that to then scale into other areas. But exactly like you said, a solution that's built for Australians, particularly in healthcare, might need to change significantly to go into different markets as different regulations, different kind of payer that, systems yeah. as well. It's um, not as easy as kind of do it once right. and then stamp it multiple right, places right. around the yeah. world. Got it. Lastly, then thinking about as we move into this next stage of that that hype cycle, then <laughs> what's what? How can what kind of attitude? What kind of things can can those working in the space take into it to make the most of it and come through the other side? Well, I think you know. First of all, you got to if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to really understand the problem you're solving. Mm. If it's actually a problem, yes. first of all, and who has it, and what motivates them to fix it, and what would they pay for that, and really dig into that mm. you know I think too all too often entrepreneurs not just here or any or in the US is the same problem you know don't spend enough time really categorizing or qualifying their the problem solving they can undertake yes really understanding the motivations of the marketplace individually like talk to 50 customers mm. you know uh, or prospective customers really understand and if they say I will never buy this believe it Mm. You know, um, or if they say, I would buy this, but you would have to do X, Y, Z. Believe that, too. You know, really take it in. Um, I think entrepreneurs take too little time proving the return on investment of their proposition. That should be done quite early. And it's hard and it's expensive, yes, but it has to be done Mm. or you can't survive. And I think, you know, plan for the long-term hill that you have to climb, you know, and don't overspend. Be capital efficient to the extent possible. It's going to be a tough two years for companies to raise money, at least. Mm. And so being very, very thoughtful about spending, you know, buy the one ply toilet paper, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Spend like um, it takes a long time, I think exactly. you said as well. Yeah. You know, and really, yeah. really think about that. And also thinking about not just growth, but profitability as a, as a key yes. milestone, right? You may not know when it's coming, but you should be heading towards it, you yeah. know, trying. And I think, you know, those are the things that any company in any market should be thinking about right now. Mm. Elizabeth Koff, Managing Director of Telstra Health. Thanks for joining, Elizabeth. And uh, I've, I've managed to, to grab you from off the stage and uh, from a, a panel. There was a lot of people up on that stage, and I think the term was rock stars that Gavin used who was moderating the session. But the, talk to me a bit about the panel session that you were participating in today. The It was very flattering to be called a rock star panel, <laughs> I must admit, in the scheme of things. But it was really highlighting uh, the people who soldiered on through COVID because I think COVID was really an inflection point for 
health systems and the digital agenda mm. um, that we'll never experience again. And the fundamental uh, proposition was, have we changed the dynamic in digital health now post-COVID or was it an aberration? And uh, that's the question that was interrogated. Yeah. I heard there was some good engagement from uh, those in the audience as well. And generally there was different themes I found because there was representations on the stage from uh, the vendor community, I guess, from a broader health perspective. And um, and of course, with, with Telstra Health as well, you see you see healthcare across different kind of aspects of healthcare as well. What, what kind of thoughts did you have coming into the session and, and some of those those points that were, were discussed during the, the day? Look, from my perspective, I think my perspective more predominantly related to my six years as being Secretary for New South Wales Health. Mm. Um, so running the New South Wales Health System, Brett Sutton and I did have quite a bit of in common uh, from the New South Wales versus Victorian perspective. But the changes that we made in health systems during that COVID phase, which we're still not out of, were significant. And in my mind, they did change the way we delivered care and hopefully we can hang on to those things. So from basic things such as contact tracing, we had to surge our digital uh, contact tracing uh, initiatives. Uh, for things such as even sequencing, the PCR testing uh, for COVID, um, the capacity then to text people their COVID results. doesn't sound as if it's terribly innovative, but in health, we'd never no. actually sent people their test results. And, and that, was, that was a change that we made. But within hospital services, there was a significant change to the way we delivered care uh, in terms of using analytics for triage to moving to virtual care for outpatients. And in terms of managing our vulnerable population groups, we had so much data available to be able to identify who was high risk, what the vulnerable populations might be, and to make really timely targeted interventions for those population groups. And not to mention the last thing, vaccination rollout. Um, we we really deployed digital means for, for vaccination rollout, even from the perspective of digital appointments to turning up to tracking vaccination rates in certain population groups, and from the customer insights to who was vaccine hesitant. Uh, so it really was an end-to-end -end process for managing of the pandemic that had very strong component parts of digital enablement through yeah. it. Some great examples there. One, one point that came up during the discussion, I think from the Q&A was, and it's a question that always comes up around this too, is, you know, how much can actually change unless there is structural reform or, you know, the, the funding to drive the performance. But I think um, what I liked from that kind of discussion that came out, I think you kind of touched on a point that suggested, you know, there's a lot of different there's the environment in which we're operating, and I'm going to kind of re-paraphrase re how I understood it, but there's we're operating in this particular environment. Not everything can be kind of addressed all at once, but focusing on a particular problem to be solved is probably the the, the best case forward. How do you kind of think about that? Have I, have I kind of got that right in terms of thinking about yeah, the look, look, definitely, situation? yeah. And I, one of the um, examples that I think demonstrated that we actually do have the capacity and capability, but we haven't had the desire, urgency mm. or, or conviction and will um, was electronic prescribing during COVID. Right. Um, Telstra Health actually has uh, FRED, um, which has the electronic script exchange. Mm. And as it is reported to me, a late ministerial call on a Friday afternoon said, do you think we might be able to get the electronic script exchange active by Monday morning? Um, and the team said, uh, sure, it was not without a lot of effort uh, mm. and intense work. But, you know, the fact that that was there available, able to be mobilised, demonstrates in my mind that we do have a lot of technical know-how, uh, but we just haven't had that urgency to implement and go forward. Part of that also too is having spent many years in health, we do have a lot of uh, risk aversion, understandably, um, that you know, digital health solutions clinical safety and patient uh, safety is absolutely paramount. And sometimes I think we just wait too long to get something that's 100% 
perfect mm. um, that gets in the way of good. Yeah, that's right. Getting in the way of good, that's such a good, a good point. And I think that was the, the sentiment too I got from that session was um, from another panellist who mentioned that in healthcare generally we're quite good at finding the things that might potentially go wrong before even jumping in and having a go when obviously important to keep in, into consideration those security and, and patient risk points, but there's there's got to be a balance. I guess to perhaps reframe some of those points and, and lastly to to someone who might be thinking about trying to to make an impact in healthcare, whether it's from a startup phase or, or frontline clinician, but might be feeling like there's, you know, we've gone through this big rush of the, the COVID push, but now feels like things might be slowing down or how do we kind of drive things forward? Taking some of those points you've reflected on this session, how might someone, you know, think their way through these next steps to keep making a change? Look, I think critically the policy environment is what I call ambiguous at the moment. Mm. There's so many moving pieces in health policy at the moment with a new government coming in. But when you look at the Medicare Action Group and, and how primary care operates, I think there'll be significant digital opportunities in that space. Um, also with the aged care reform, uh, there's going to be significant changes in that space. It's moving very, very slowly. But the government definitely seems to have an appetite um, to, to start, I guess, incorporating digital components as fundamental to a reform agenda. The, the advice for people who are in the digital space, though, um, you may think you have the best solution, but you've really got to think it through. Is there going to be market demand for mm. that? Because the best solution in the world will not be successful if there's not a market demand for it. Um, and obviously, uh, the necessary and prerequisite investment, which is where Ant Health is so wonderful. My name is Luke. I'm founder and, uh, and CEO of uh, VaxApp, an immunisation management platform that enables uh, workplace health providers, uh, pharmacies and public health services like local governments or, or public health units to vaccinate more people in less time with less cost mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately improve patient outcomes, whether that's vaccination uptake or uh, accessibility for, for patients to vaccines. Um, that's our, our, our real focus. Yes, yeah, so, sir. You were up on stage at the Ant Health event today and talk to me a bit about the session that you were participating in. Participating in a session uh, around the importance of buying uh, really Australian Australian made and really capturing Australian innovation for Australians. Mm. Uh, we've, uh, at Vaxab, we've developed um, the first of its kind in, in the world, uh, an immunisation eligibility engine that automates the suggestion of what vaccines are uh, a patient is eligible to receive mm -hmm. and when they can have those throughout their entire life. So we prompt the uptake of additional vaccines that the, the person isn't necessarily aware that they can have. Um, for example, with, with one of our, our clients, uh, we've doubled the uptake of meningococcal B vaccinations in their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, which is a, a great patient outcome improvement, mm -hmm. essentially. Really exploring, I think, more the government side of things, mm. both at state and federal and for us with our, our kind of clients, uh, also at a local government level and the importance of, uh, I guess, government and public health services being, a, uh, I heard a, a number today, around 70% of the the funding or the spend in in health is uh, from government and the importance from i guess a government perspective around um when they talk about innovation and grants or whether it's r d tax credits uh or we talk about the wider investor uh ecosystem that we mm. have in australia the best way to actually invest in australian digital health and and innovation is actually to procure it yeah uh, and that's what really creates that sustainable revenue streams um, for Australian digital health companies and the ability for us to um, really be at the forefront of global digital health. Um, I think as well, some, some themes that I took out of the conversation I heard today was, you know, it can be from a procurement perspective, they might go through, this is a very broad kind of suggestion, but to say, well, we looked around and we couldn't find anything, so we've gone overseas to get something else. But there's a lot of um, activated and engaged uh, vendors in Australia that have the opportunity to employ more Australians and to deliver the work for Australian 
the Australian healthcare system, if there was better engagement with those providers or the buyers or perhaps a more collaborative approach towards solving some of the problems, as opposed to kind of looking from the outside saying, well, it doesn't look like they do it, let's go overseas and kind of solve it. Does Do you think perhaps having better en- engagement between the customers and the, the creators of the, the technology will help us get a lot further to you know having Australians creating stuff for Australians? I definitely hope so. <laughs> uh, one of the things we've definitely seen in the vaccination uh, space is um, whether it's something where I guess government is looking to, to custom build and they often look towards um, large overseas tech brands. Mm. That that saying that you know I've heard time and time again from from people in the industry is you don't get fired for hiring IBM, for right. example, regardless of whether the, the the custom build or project ends up uh, eventuating to yeah. uh, a platform that provides you know the intended value um, or, or any value. An example: a state government has spent uh, over. Forty million dollars on immunization management platform custom builds um, just in the last five years. Uh, Thirty-three million of that was with uh, a Microsoft platform. Um, most recently, just this year, uh, fifteen million dollars that uh, it didn't even go through uh, or to tender to even mm. be open to the Australian, uh, I guess, digital health market to even show how they could support. Um, that was something that. Uh, is really trying to custom build something that already exists here. In, yeah. in- and so lastly then, Luke, thinking about then for as we move into the new year for VaxApp and, you know, with all these, you know, through the pandemic and moving into this kind of new area, what can we look forward to seeing from VaxApp in 2023 and beyond? Great question, Pete. Uh, <laughs> VaxApp's really evolving to become uh, a complete preventative health management platform. So extending beyond vaccinations and really looking at how we can better support our, our pharmacy and workplace health provider uh, clients. In terms of areas like health assessments, um, whether that's uh, leveraging some of the, the latest Australian uh, digital health products, like hearing screening, uh, for, for example, there's a, a fantastic company called uh, SoundScouts. Um, that uh, is doing some some incredible things uh, in in the hearing space. Uh, so really supporting our, our pharmacy and workplace health clients with other types of preventative health services or products that they can offer. Uh, so there will be a rebrand for for VaxApp in the in the coming months. Uh, keep an eye out for for that. And um, yeah, we'll be excited to share more about how we're improving the preventative health of uh, of, of Australians. And um, shortly, uh, as we expand into the UK and uh, a few other markets, um, hopefully, impact a lot more people uh, across the globe. Dr. Brandon Carp, I'm a doctor. I still say I'm a doctor, but I've had a sort of a career in uh, in entrepreneurship, having founded a business called UHG or Unified Healthcare Group, mm-hmm. where I spent most of my time over 20 years as CEO, founder, and ultimately as executive chair. And since that time, and even during that time, I've uh, founded and been involved in a number of other healthcare businesses, both those for profit and those not for profit as well, like Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Mm. Got it. So well placed to moderate this session that you had today. Talk to us a bit about uh, the session that you were you were running today at the Zand Health event. Yeah, you know, the session was really about uh, clinical entrepreneurs, those people who've come from uh, a background of being a clinician, whether it was a doctor or an allied health professional. Mm. Uh, and their journeys to entrepreneurship and, and founding businesses. And there was, you know, a, a diverse group, those that had been allied professionals, those that had been doctors, um, those that started virtually straight out of their degrees, mm-hmm. and a, a gentleman who started his entrepreneurial journey in his early 50s. So a really diverse group. Um, but I think the key message was that, you know, clinicians are well-placed to uh, to be entrepreneurs, well placed to solve problems and identify opportunities in healthcare, being at the cold face, and I'm passionate about really their role in transforming healthcare, and I think they have a real place uh, going forward and have had some significant impacts, uh, you know, in the past. Yeah, no, and, and and I know you know the stuff you've done to advocate for for um, 
not not to give clinicians permission, but but to let clinicians know it's okay to and encourage them to be entrepreneurial. Because I know your story a little bit more too, and 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 I guess that certainly wasn't the case maybe 10, 20 years ago for some clinicians. Yeah, look, certainly when I started my entrepreneurial journey, um, I was training to be a dermatologist partway through in my early 30s, just married and decided to, you know, slide into a moment, start a business. Uh, I did continue as a clinician for over 10 years, but, you know, giving away a dermatology training position at the time was, was seemed like madness. Mm. Uh, there was no real pathway for entrepreneurship. There was a, not really a lot of role models for what I'd done. Um, fast forward today, you know, we've got the Australian Clinical Entrepreneur Program that was recently launched, uh, set up by um, MTP Connect or funded by MTP Connect and driven by Melbourne University and University of WA. Mm. And, you know, it, it's applauded now for doctors and other clinicians to use their talents to improve healthcare through entrepreneurship and to have impact at scale rather than one by one. And it seems that that is now looked upon as a good thing, not mm. necessarily as leaving uh, you know, a, a profession where you've spent a lot of time. Yeah, I could only imagine that it feels like a, you know, where, where you spend all that time in building up and, and, and all the support you get from those around you to do that. It can feel like a significant sunk cost to leave it all behind in inverted commas, but it sounds like then a lot of those skills and capabilities you learn as a clinician apply really well to entrepreneurship, it sounds like too. Yeah, look, I've been asked a lot of times, you know, do I regret doing my medical degree? And, and certainly I practiced as a clinician for over 20 years and enjoyed, you know, it very much. But I wouldn't have got to the role that I had in entrepreneurship had I not hmm. been a clinician. Everything that I did really um, was identifying problems and opportunities from being a doctor and seeing patients and understanding the health system and understanding providers and the payer model. And therefore, I don't regret it in any way, shape or form. And in fact, I wouldn't have been where I am today without doing it. So, um, you know, it, it's fundamental to who I am and, uh, you know, I enjoyed every bit of it. Yeah. And lastly, Brandon, there'd no doubt be clinicians who could be dabbling with something on the side or even thinking about doing something a bit more than simply seeing patients every day. Um, what advice do you give to those clinicians that are looking at broadening out and doing something a bit more entrepreneurial? Look, I think the first thing is if you want to do it, if you've got a passion for doing it, then do it. You know, um, as I talked about on the panel, there are some golden handcuffs that come with being a clinician. Mm. You get used to a certain um, remuneration and it's hard to give that up the further you go through. But, you know, if you want to make an impact at scale, um, you know, founding a business, um, solving a problem uh, as an entrepreneur really does that. So, you know, my, my advice is uh, take the plunge, take the chance. It's enormously rewarding, enjoyable, and I think the healthcare system can do with improvement and transforming and clinicians are well placed to do that. For more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com. Dot com.